Hey everybody, welcome to day 90 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. I'm so glad to see you again today. We're looking today at 1 Samuel 7 through 9, a great text of scripture. Shortly after Dallas Seminary was founded in 1924, that's my favorite seminary, uh, it came to the brink of bankruptcy. The bank was going to foreclose at noon on a certain day, and so all the leaders of the school got together to pray that the Lord might intervene and keep the school going. Uh, while they were praying, it came around to uh, Harry Ironside's turn to pray. And he prayed a, an interesting prayer. He said, um, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Please sell some of the cattle and send us the money. While they were praying, a Texas rancher walked into the business office. He told the secretary, I just sold two carloads of cattle in Fort Worth. I've been trying to make a business deal go through, but it won't work. I feel that God is compelling me to give this money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. Well, the secretary hated to interrupt the prayer meeting, but she knew how important this was. So she knocked on the door and Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer answered the door and saw that the check was in the exact amount of money they needed. And so he turned and he said to Harry Ironside, he said, Harry, God just sold the cattle. And so it was. Today, we are reading about Samuel's reminder, Ebenezer, to his generation, that the Lord had helped them many times in the past, indicating that he was very likely to help them again. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 7 through 9 in the King James Version of the Bible with updated vocabulary, but you can follow along in another version if you prefer. 1 Samuel chapter 7 verse 1. And the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and got up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark remained in Kirjath-Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts to the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth, and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it for a burned offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burned offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, and confused them, and they were stricken down before Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down until they came to beth Car. And Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Up till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more in the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored, to Is were restored to Israel from Ekron, even unto Gath, and the coasts of it, Israel delivered out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for his house was there, and he judged Israel there, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. Chapter 8. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after money and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said to him, 
See, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they do also to you. Now, therefore, listen to their voice, but still protest solemnly to them and show them the manner of the king who shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give that to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your male servants and your female servants and your most handsome young men and your burrows and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep, and you shall be his servants, and you shall cry out in that day because of your king which you have chosen, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, so that he may, we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. Chapter 9. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and handsome. And there was not among the children of Israel a more handsome person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was taller than any of the people. And the burrows of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with you, and rise up, and go look for the burrows. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalishah, and they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalom, and they were not there. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. And when they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the burrows and take thought for us. And he said to him, See now, there is in this city a man of God, and he's an honorable man. All that he says comes surely to pass. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can show us our way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But see, if we go, what shall we bring the man for the bread is gone in our vessels, and there's not a present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, See, I have here on hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said this, Come, let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, He is. See, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as you have come into the city, you shall find him uh, before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he blesses the sacrifice, and afterward those who are invited eat. Now therefore, go up, for about this time you shall find him. 
And they went up into the city, and when they had come into the city, see, Samuel came out before them to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man out of the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, See, the man whom I spoke to you of, this same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I ask you, where the seer's house is? And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. And as for your burrows that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all your father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among those who were invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it aside by you. And the cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, See, that which is left, set it before you and eat. For unto this time has it been kept for you, since I said I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the break of day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Rise up, that I may send you away. And Saul arose, and they went out both of them, he and Samuel, outside. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, uh, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand still a while, that I may show you the word of God. And so ends chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. We see in the beginning of our reading today, chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, that the ark was in Kirjath Jerim for 20 years. And then we see that uh, Samuel has set up this Ebenezer, uh, a stone of help, um, in Mizpah in the face of another Philistine threat. And this threat is eventually fended off, either largely or really you'd say totally, by supernatural defeat because God caused a great thunder to come. And then Samuel set up the stone in Mizpah, and they called it Ebenezer. And you see in verse 12 of chapter 7, it means, up till now the Lord has helped us. Up till now. And we're going to say more about this at the end of our episode. But just notice that Samuel is saying, well, the Lord has been good to us so far. And that implies that he's going to be good to us again in the future. Uh, we see that there's also, by the way, another Ebenezer different from this one in chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. So just bear in mind there's more than one place called Ebenezer in Scripture. In chapter 7, verse 15, we see that Samuel is called a judge of Israel. So this is like the book of Judges. The book of Judges leans over into 1 Samuel, and Samuel is also a judge. And he's the bridge from the time of the Judges to the time of the kings, as he anoints the first king, Saul, as well as the second king, David. Samuel is the bridge person between the judges and the kings. In um, <clears throat> chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, you'll see that as godly as Samuel was, and he was extraordinary, his two sons, Joel and Abijah, were corrupt, accepting bribes and perverting justice. And it just reminds us that no matter how good a parent you are, you can't decide for your children how they are going to live their lives. They are their own little souls, and they eventually have to decide for themselves. And Samuel's sons were not like Samuel. 
In chapter 8, verses 4 through 9, we see that the people of Israel have requested a king. And so the king is requested in verse 5. They say they want to be like all nations and have a king like every other nation. Uh, that is a very bad motive to uh, cave in to doing what all the people around you are doing, especially if those people are pagan individuals, and they were. And yet, uh, the Lord says in verse 7, Go ahead and listen to them. It's not your problem. It's not you that they are rejecting. Ultimately, it's me. They have rejected me. And in verse 8, the Lord says, But of course, what they have done to me in rejecting me, they are now rejecting you as well. So you and I are all entangled in this. And, and the Lord understands that when you have followed the Lord, the reproaches of the ones that uh, insult Jesus also come on you. And, and yet it is worth it, right? So we have to be like Samuel in that way. And then we come in verse 9, and the Lord says, But but tell them, protest to them solemnly what will the king be like when they have a king. And we see that as the king is described, uh, he is going to make their people servants. He's going to tax them with, with tithes. And uh, we're just reminded that in Mark 10, when Jesus was describing how the Gentiles rule, um, they are um, parasitic. Uh, Gentile rulers are exploitative and parasitic and oppressive. And the Lord says, okay, you want a king just like all the other nations? That's how it will be. And it will be grievous. And of course, that's the way it turns out. In chapter 9, we are introduced to the person who will be the first ever king of Israel. It is Saul. Interestingly, he's from Gibeah. And here we have like exclamation points. Gibeah, this is where those people sorely abuse the concubine in Judges 19 through 20. You know, Gibeah, yikes, this is where Saul is from. He is, of course, also then from the tribe of Benjamin. This was the tribe that was almost uh, destroyed, and now it is repopulated. But, but amazing that this is where the first king comes from. Like, yikes, worst case scenario, right? But we see that he's very tall. He's very handsome. He's a loyal son. We appreciate that. He's evidently, for some reason, ignorant of Samuel. And his servant has to tell him about Samuel. Weird, right? And so he's ignorant of Samuel. That's not great. In chapter 9, verse 9, we see this little explanation about the terms prophet and seer. In the old days, we find uh, the prophets used to be called seers because they see things that other people don't see. They have foresight and insight, and so they're called seers. And then later they're called prophets. In chapter 9, verse 21, we get a glimpse of Saul's early humility. And this is so great. When Saul was first called, he was indeed very humble, and, and we appreciate that. This is an example of what we should all be, and his example falls apart later in time. But at this time, we should all be like Saul in humility. He was surprised. You know, why do you speak about me this way? You know, on whom is the desire of all Israel? Like me, I'm a nobody. And you just appreciate that. When he went back after his anointing and he knew what Samuel pronounced on him, he didn't tell his family. That's amazing. Uh, when it came time to uh, appoint him king, uh, he was hiding out of reluctance to be appointed. He was very humble. After he was appointed king, he went back to his home area and he was plowing his field, the king who plows the field. That's so humble. That's so great. When he won his first great battle, he was merciful to his detractors who said, we don't want him as king. He's very humble. And this is great. And we should all be like Saul in his early days. In chapter 9, verse 22, we see this dinner that Samuel has arranged for 30 people. It is a special dinner, as it turns out, in Saul's honor. And it was only possible that it could be in Saul's honor because the Lord gave Samuel information the day before he ever met Saul. And so once again, he was a seer. He saw what was going to happen the next day when Saul approached him. And so he's getting ready for the forthcoming anointing. And we'd read about that in chapter 10. Now, what should be our great life lesson in all of this? And we go back to that idea of the memorial called Ebenezer. It says that we set up this stone, Ebenezer, and it means up till now, the Lord has helped us. And that's so great. We should all remember what the Lord has already done for us. We have the little joke that we sometimes say when we feel unappreciated. It's like, yeah, you know, so what have you done for me lately? 
And the idea is, you know, we forget what people have done for us. We forget what God has done for us, right? But the Lord has helped us up till now. Consider this, Christ has solved the biggest problem you will ever have, and that's death. Um, death is solved by the resurrection of Jesus, by an everlasting home in paradise of heaven. Death is fixed. The Lord has done that for us up till now. The Lord has helped us, right? And he solved the biggest emotional, psychological problem we've ever had. And that is, what is our purpose? Do we even matter? Does our, does our life matter? And he has given us cosmic importance, cosmic purpose. We call that calling. And it's a high calling that we have. And so he solved our biggest ever emotional problem. And not only that, most of us have known human love and we've become God's dear companions, right? Our calling. Uh, we've become God's dear companions. And now he has called us to love our neighbors. And we've known human love, which is so sweet. Haven't people been so good to us so often? Up till now, the Lord has helped us. And what about enoughness? You know, enough food, enough shelter, enough liberty, enough sunny days. Up till now, the Lord has helped us, right? And so I think that should be our prayer as we close our lesson today. Prayer, uh, thanks for enoughness and commitment to trust the Lord in the future because up till now, he's been very good to us. So I hope you'll pray in your heart as I pray out loud. Will you do that? Father God, we do want to thank you for the enoughness. Up till now, you have helped us. And we forget that sometimes, but today we're remembering, we're recalling. And Lord, we're also saying that now we will trust you with the future because up till now, it is clear that you've been good to us. So we trust you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, God bless you today. Thank you for joining me for day 90 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. And I sure hope I get to see you tomorrow for day 91. Bye-bye.